One of your most personal possessions is your signature. It is the essence and the embodiment of who we are. This is San Francisco, Northern California, home to some of the finest graffiti artists the world has known. A city famous for its beautiful skyline, steep hills, and diverse cultures. Graffiti has played a major part in the city for the last 20 years. This is the untold story of our city's graffiti history, told piece by piece. We started out around 83, there were so many cats doing graph, I and mean, it was just, it was lovely. Man. Graffiti was rocking, Frisco was wrecked. Oh man, San Francisco is a, is, is a playground for graffiti, I mean, you know. Everyone that I know that's come here has always thought it was pretty easy to get over. It's a major small city, and it has a rich history. This is where I, this is where I crush. You know, there were so many crews, so many riders, so many battles, you know, lots of beef. I mean, just nobody wanted to stop, you know. Day and night. Day and night, every, you gotta get a bomb. If you've never painted, never ran from the bomb, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Sitting at home and painting on the canvas is weird. And I just put my name where it needs to be. Give me anything, I'll put my name on it. Mailbox, tunnel, truck, train, I don't care, you know? The name of the game is to put your name on something. When I go out and do graffiti, I inherently feel as though I'm destroying, but I'm also giving something. You know, they still consider it uh, vandalism. <laughs> If it is, it's creative. I'm just gonna focus on the overall look. Does it look pretty, you know, is it eye candy? Does the character stand out? Yeah. Once they change the dynamic, you know, the kids, the new jet, the next generation follows that because that's what they see. I mean, like people say, oh, we hate the city, you know. We don't hate the city, we love the city. This is our city, you know. No, that's why we crush, because it's our city. Yeah, yeah. Put your ass in the back, back, back. I think graffiti is part of an urban life. Just like noise and buildings and, and smog and people accept that. It's against the law. Police department has dedicated offices just to fighting graffiti. If we catch you in San Francisco, we'll slam you. I put guys out undercover every night. If we catch you, we'll slam you. If I catch heat while I'm painting, I'm not trying to hang out and see how the cops are going to treat me. I'm doing whatever the fuck I can to get away. All you're doing is changing the color of a surface. A millimeter thick. But they're saying it's a $5,000 damage because of what? Because the building's worth $5,000? It only takes two seconds to brush it over. Maybe 20 bucks worth of paint. I'm not saying it's right. The graffiti's not all good. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's kind of interesting seeing the different generations throughout the 80s and 90s, and now the 2000s. It's work given to the people that are on the street. You know, this is artwork for the people. It's not that I can't stop. I don't want to stop. Like, I'm just getting started myself. <laughs> I've been in some fucking good chases. I gotten away from most of them. I got my ass kicked a few times. I got my nose broken. I got my head split open. I got fucking taken to jail. Oh no, I, I always thought graffiti was dope. Like I wanted like my first tattoo to be like a train car with graffiti on it. And like luckily enough, I fucking didn't get that because the shit would have been whack, you know? They told me don't write graffiti. They said don't fucking write graffiti. You're an idiot. You, you're gonna, you're just gonna get yourself in trouble. There's no point in doing it. Don't fucking do it. And I just did it anyways. You know, I had everyone tell me I'm a fucking idiot. Why are you doing this? What the fuck is your problem? And I just still did it. I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Nobody, you know, no one knows you, except for you know the few who know who you are. It's like some superhero shit, you know. Like you just fucking fly out, do your shit, come back. Like you're just a mild-mannered reporter, you know. <laughs> I can't even drive a car, like, in, in the city, my eyes are just like the Terminator, just like scanning, like, meh, 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 just scanning, like, every rooftop, everything, seeing every tag, seeing every scribe, like, I just want to see everything, even if it's whack or not, oh, shit, they got that, oh, shit, they got that, it's like, you just look at your city like a grid, like a map, you know, and just look at everything, like, a lot differently once you write graffiti. The city has like always been some, something for graffiti, you know, There's, they've always had a, a, a little heart for graffiti here. You know, San Francisco has always been about it, you know, like, there's still, you meet people, old ass people who, oh yeah, Twist, yeah, I love Twist. Twist is the greatest guy, you know, like, he's the shit, we love his shit. Oh, the little, the horse, oh, those, those are so tight, you know, people are always, like, had love for, for graffiti in San Francisco.
late nights, early mornings, uh, trips to go steal, uh, trips to go paint. Someone told me something when I was a kid and they said being a graffiti writer is probably the most quintessential thing you can do growing up, you know, to have an identity. And I thought it was kind of silly when he said it, but now when I look back in hindsight, uh, it, it definitely it combines a lot of different elements of life and balance is important, you know. I will never stop doing it because that's just me, you know. I'm a lifer. I'm going to do that forever. We both grew up in uh, Southern California. I'm not going to say where. Well, having a good graffiti partner, I mean, you either have a good one or you don't have one at all. I mean, you're better off painting by yourself. You can't trust the person you're with. I really like having a good partner. You know, having a good partner, somebody that's solid and steady and fucking, you don't have to worry about, that's, that's the best thing in the world. I mean, graffiti is basically this. It's one, creating some kind of letter or message, right? So we got a design. Two, getting the supplies. Three, getting the spot. Four, getting to the spot. Five, attempting it, pulling it off, and then coming back and documenting it. And that's it, you know? You know, to get people to like really notice your shit, you gotta just go up huge, you know? Right up in their face, you know? Humongous, like, how the fuck did they do that? What the fuck did they do that with? That's, that's the approach I'm going for. We got really good at doing uh, pieces in illegal spots, like full color, wild style, and maybe sometimes even better than stuff you could see on a legal wall that took four hours. Vandalism. I like vandalism. I'm a vandal. But like, I'm creeping past people's windows, climbing their fire escapes, like walking basically right past people's heads almost to get to these spots. And you know, nobody's saying shit. Well, most writers are fucking total wankers. They're just punks, you know? That's how I started. I just got sophisticated or change, you know, adapt, because it's something I like to do. It's good therapy for me, you know? That's my release in life, you know? That's what I like to do. Walk around town with my head held high, you know? They don't know nothing about that. They don't know anything about it. It's none of their business. That's my business. I'm a writer, a graffiti writer. I write the nom de plume of my alter ego all over the place. I've written on everything, and uh, chances are you most likely see me up in the streets. I love letters. I'm a letter fiend. I was a normal kid. <laughs> yeah, right. I was a bit of a wild child. I was always into something, some kind of mischief, some kind of trouble. I picked up on writing at an early age though, probably fourth grade. And ever since then I dedicated myself to the craft. At first it was fun and games, and then the addiction kind of grew. At this point, it's kind of like a religion to me. I know it may sound strange, but it's my way of prayer. It's like a meditation in a way. A release. The 
It's a praise to the good and a sacrifice to the bad. It's creative destruction, really. You're creating at the same time you're destroying. I figure I've gone this far, there's no real reason to turn back now. The first writing styles to influence all of us were the styles of the Spanish neighborhoods, known as Cholo writing. These were neighborhood nicknames announcing their affiliations to blocks and certain hoods. I came here in 82 the first time. Um, there was uh, nothing New York style. There was the local graph from the, you know, the, the Latin boys. A lot of the Cholos were doing like a lot of the tagging and stuff. Then they got into the Roman numerals. And after they got to the Roman numerals, they start making their letters bigger, their numbers bigger, and they start putting 3D on it, and they start fading them from the bottom. At that point, that was 81, 82, early 83. This style has sharp, rigid lines, usually a block-type font. Not the graffiti we know today. That was just a little more neighborhood-oriented, kind of cholo homeboy hit up. I think that everyone in San Francisco saw it, and it's a permanently entrenched part of California's history. I think the first writer that we had met out here that was, he was from here, but he was already really kind of knew what was going on. He had been somewhat traveled and, and seen things and kind of understood the whole concept of graffiti as it is today. And um, his name was Riff. Riff, of course. Riff. Riff. Uh, Riff was kind of my style. He's the the dubs, the 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 right. Riff taught them all. Like, picture uh, real graffiti and then picture Cholo on something in the middle. That was Riff. And everything that Riff was doing, that's how I wanted to be. I wanted, he would go to the store and rack 50 cans of paint, and I would want to rack 50 cans of paint. So he was definitely, at that point, an influence. You know, and his styles were just off, off the wall back then. We were creating a lot of stuff based on what we thought sh stuff should look like and not really not really knowing so it was kind of coming original and coming creative because we didn't know what was going on half look back at it now it's like what the fuck were we doing but you know at that point it was it was all new things began to change influences from outside of the bay area began to appear there was cuba from baltimore zephyr from new york bringing with them a new aesthetic the tag the purpose of the tag is getting your signature up on as many surfaces as possible, quickly and efficiently, without being seen or caught. Us not having a subway system, we focused on the bus lines, Muni. Getting as many lines as possible. Get ready for a lot of fun and excitement. Now, let's start. I used to ride the uh, 52 line, and as you see these two tags on the back of the bus, Every time I get on the on the bus, I would say, "Damn, uh, there's that name again. There's that name again. There's that name again." We would ride on buses in Daly City, and the buses would go downtown and come back. And when they come back, they'd have all these new names on it. And this, you know, in the same day, maybe a couple hours later. Bus hopper style is a totally different style. Frisco hand styles are infamous. You know, I went to Paris, and and there are Frisco hand styles in Paris directly from Frisco. The stuff that was Philly. Yeah, we got our own style, and, and as long as people respect that and not try and down it, I don't got a problem. At the same time, stay off my block. This was the first cat I ever seen destroy a whole bus by us. He ran up to the bus, <laughs> told me, hey, get away from me, get out of my way. He just, you know, threw me to the side with this one. You know, crashed the 14th. He was a shit. <laughs> but what we used to do is we would find a place where we'd all get together and we'd just go mob buses. buses. The first person get in front of the bus and everybody just kill it. Every 
everything's been cleaned up. Back in the days, every one of them was bombed. Throw ups on them, tags. Uh, the trains back in the days was layers upon layers. I mean, it was as bad as New York. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I found your plus fish. Uh, once I was on a 15 Third Street bus and uh, a young man was marking with a funky marker, they stink as well. And I told him, you know, that it was making me sick, giving me a stomach ache. And he says, uh, I don't give a fuck. Okay, well, it's our bus, you know. Yeah, we own this shit, man. We, like people say, oh, we hate the city, you know. We don't hate the city, we love the city. This is our city. You we know? hate the buses, though. It's like that. We hate the bus drivers, you know. You know, no, that's why we crush because it's our city. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. The kids who are riding on the buses, they definitely have something that they marketed as that's their own way of riding. You know, I don't particularly like, you know, always agree with, with the look, but it's theirs and they do it their way. This style of tag has remained a staple in SF's history for over 20 years and remains a vital link to our past. I first became aware of it in, in 1983 when the book uh, Subway Art came out. I didn't really think much of it. And then I saw Star Wars and actually recorded it on TV. I was in high school in 84. In 1983, PBS nationally broadcasted a documentary which showcased New York's graffiti culture to the masses. Everyone saw it. Now I watched it with my brother and my cousin, and I thought we were the only ones that seen it. But as time goes on, I realized that I wasn't the only one watching it that night. Um, Bo was watching it that night. Crash was watching it that night. Schmo was watching it that night. The things that we saw were always train pieces, so a lot of style that we kind of looked up to were a lot of the train riders in New York. We never had subway cars like New York, so we gravitated toward walls, but walls that were off the train tracks, because it made you feel like you were in the subway yard, you know, even though you weren't. Around this time, the media began to take notice of the hip-hop movement, and with this, a media explosion occurred in the form of books, such as spray can art, subway art, movies like Wild Style, Beat Street, it took America by storm, inspiring the craze that is now referred to as hip hop. I think the connection with graffiti and, and scratching and, and hip hop and emceeing and breaking is, is because it's just my roots. They were all part of one culture. Hip hop, of which graffiti is one leg of the, of the four-legged stool, is a major component. It's a multi-million dollar business. It's an uh, art form that's in museums. It's an art form that's everywhere. It's the only art form that was ever created by youth, I think, in all the history of art. Back then it was a pure time. The kids were smiling. Look at those old pictures, man. That's what they were doing. Uh, you can see it on their faces. You know, just out there to have a good time. <laughs> Graffiti. For some people, the word conjures images of allegedly scrawled messages spray-painted on the side of a building. Authorities say some of the kids who are hooked on graffiti may end up stealing to support their habit, stealing markers and paint cans. Paul Biango and his friends do burners and bombs. Those are really big graffitis. Eventually, they're marred by throw-ups. Those are initials or tags sprayed over the burners. The gangs call themselves crews. Crews began to form. A crew is a group of friends that are working towards the same goal of dominating the visual landscape. The perfect crime. Out to crush. Can't stop us now. Those damn kids. Masterpiece creators. Together with style. But the ones who stood out above the rest were TMF. I think when the whole like kind of breakdance and hip hop movement came to California, that's when I I picked up on like more elaborate styles. Like oh shit, like these guys are like doing these big big pieces with color in it and all this other stuff. And I there's nothing that we had seen before. TMF when it first started, it was in school. It was me, Bizarro, and uh, Cipher. Back then he wrote Disc, and it was three mellow fellows. And it was like mellow, not so much because we were mellow, but like we're close friends, we're the mellow. And 
in school we weren't necessarily squares but we were kind of like the, the new pocket of kids that were kind of half cool because we had something up on everybody you know we wanted to be the biggest and the best along with some style there wasn't that much out there, so we were always constantly evolving our own style and working on what we could come up with. It's, it's a trip. There's, you know, when we first started, we thought we were the shit. Well, actually, we knew we were the shit. It was kind of rolling out on, on whatever kind of media commercials or whatever back then, but they weren't really sure what it was about, but we were, we knew exactly what it was about. And it was about, it was about being down, you know? My cousin took me and gave me this tour of like San Francisco and Daly City graffiti. And uh, after that, man, you know, it just flipped me over to the other side. I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be a badass writer like, like those guys. The important thing was, you know, just getting up getting noticed, getting recognized, making noise, starting shit. It was more of a family though, it wasn't something you get good enough to be in, it just happened that those guys were dope. Writers now began to innovate their own particular styles, branching away from the traditional forms of graffiti, breaking all the rules. When this happened, a conflict arose between the opposing schools of style. The, the style back then, you had the funk, which was what TMF was doing, which was kind of uh, more of a New York flavor to it and more of a, uh, you know, a, a funky feel to it. And then you had the new wave that TWS was doing. TWS, they were a popular crew. You know, a lot of people giving them props, you know, for all the shit that they were doing, legal pieces, illegal pieces. I mean, those kids, they had skills, you know. I mean, I'll give them props, you know, this shit was tight. I think TWS is the essence of the original San Francisco flavor, yeah. where they mastered that form, they were innovative, they were executing shit that had never been done in the fucking world. We created this crew called TWS with me, Raven, um, Styles, um, you know, Risque, Norm, um, Picasso. Our concept was every guy could pretty much handle the whole ball of wax. We could do fucking characters, you could do letters, you could do straight letters, wild style, whatever, right? And then you took that and, and you amplified it. And we, uh, we hooked up with Jim Pergoff when he was doing a book, Spray Can Art. And he was showing me things like from uh, Paris, you know, uh, from London. And that influenced us, you know, to do what they were doing and try to top that. So our stuff looked different, you know what I'm saying? Before I met those guys, you know, I had style and I was doing full color burners. But as soon as I, you know, as soon as we started hanging out, started painting together, they kind of showed me how it's done, so to speak. You know, it's like, check it out. You know, my pieces got longer, they got bigger, taller, more wild. The style became more complex. We started doing Ferraris up on the wall, you know, like crazy Robotech characters, you know, stuff that uh, normal people wouldn't get influenced on, you know. So we started doing different stuff, you know. It's uh, it was it was a badass crew, man. The two dominant styles of the time were traditional funk, based on New York style subway graffiti, and new wave which stretched the boundaries, pushed the limits of what had been done previously. These two opposite schools of style battled for the visual supremacy of the city. A battle is settled on the walls by crossing each other out, basically taking over an opponent's work. People here are strong in the art of letter form. Toys who come up are grounded in letter form. You know, everybody down with the funk, you know, just could not even fathom how those kids could, you know, claim to be kings in, in, in graffiti, you know, because they didn't have no letters, you know, no letters, man. I think he called it slice and shift, and it had a lot of thick bars going to thin bars, and, and to me it just really didn't make a lot of sense. It was kind of too artsy, and there was no structure to the letters. Letters, that's graffiti, you know what I'm saying? That's the foundation of graffiti. If you don't have letters, you know, you, you're not a dope graph writer. Let's get ready to rumble, y'all.
It was like a lot of politics going on in the scene with what side of the city chose what crew, you know? It's like if you were in the Richmond, you kind of went with Crayon, and if you were in the Mission, you went with TMF. A lot of people hated on Rigel, man. And all he was doing was just pushing the boundaries on graffiti and not saying it's gotta look this one way or whatever, you know? Either you understand how to rock styles or you don't. And it can't really always be explained to people. And back then it was, you know, we just weren't feeling their style. And to, to kind of back, back that up, we would just start beef about it. There was a lot of animosity, man, other than the fact that we were the two top crews. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to beef with anybody, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, I wasn't going to back down to anything. We'd do a few pieces, but a lot of the mission was just like, fuck them, we'll just go right on theirs. At that point when you're beefing with somebody, yeah, it's just fun destroying somebody's stuff. I believe battles is like a double-edged sword, you know? It's good for the system of, of pushing the element, pushing the culture forward to do some new stuff, but it also um, has animosity. You know, I think nowadays there's just really a good will among writers, but at the same time, it, it makes things kind of soft. When, you, when you're battling, sometimes you have to get up at night and there's a whole new you know, things you have to deal with that you're not really, that no, just normal artists don't deal with, period, you know? So we're unique in that area. San Francisco rapidly became the epicenter for writing. Writers from all over the Bay Area would visit the city to decorate its walls. People from Berkeley, San Jose, Sacramento, Hayward, San Mateo. One who stood out was a writer from Oakland by the name of Dream. I remember him being a, a skinny kid, just, just, just hungry, man, just ready to just start bombing. And he wound up making a name for himself. And he did that best of both worlds piece, man. When he did that piece, bro, that that was like a shockwave throughout the Bay Area. That was just like, boom, I'm here now. My name is Dream. It's time to tell the roof off the mother sucker. Direct to you from oh, oh. Oh. I felt like I felt like I knew Dream so much because I had been following his graffiti for so long. And the thing that stood out about Dream was he wasn't getting famous off of characters, he was getting famous off of his still pieces. The main thing that he ever told me was, uh, you know, make sure your tags are always dope, because if your tags are dope, people want to see more of what you can do. Style, unmatched, he was our, like, scene, you know? He was the pioneer of, of it all. I did like his work, I mean, but he had like, at that time, if I'm not mistaken, it was more like a New York type style, you know, going on. The reason I respected Dream was because he came over, got up, and hit what was on the wrong wall spoke for itself. Right. He had been in the app and all that stuff. When I met Dream, that was the first thing. He was like, yo, man, I want to hook up with you and hopefully do something, you know, I want to come back. and. And I was like, yo, bet, that'll be fat, you know, that'll be hot to represent. Plus, you know, we both represent the same crew, FC. And I would have loved to do a, a, a piece with Dream, you know, and when I heard that he passed, it, it, was, it was sad, you know, it was, it was just wrong. Dream was the king with an untouchable style. And in 2000, he was tragically murdered on the streets of Oakland. We all suffered a great loss. The dude was, he was, He's really very positive person, and just just a pleasure to be around. And he's just a good dude, and I miss him. I miss him a lot. Dream was a street hustler and style technician, yes, but he was revolutionary minded, and he studied. He always stressed that people should know themselves, learn their roots and their culture. Well, Dream should be remembered for the fact that he was a good person at heart, which was what you say not too rare usually not like a mama's boy or whatever, but he had a very unique style that was good to remember. You know, Mike was definitely, you know, real to it, man. He, he, he did what he did and you saw it evolve. You saw when he started and you saw it up to, up to when it ended. You can't help but give somebody respect who put something down that long. You know, so many different generations of graffiti got to catch a glimpse of what he did. And um, there's not that many people that last that long. You know, I mean, most people probably write for, what, a couple years, you know, get up for a couple years. And, you know, after that, they're written about in the books, but he was there for the long haul.
One of the aspects of writing is going out and seeking places to paint. These are often called yards. Some of the notorious yards of the Bay Area were places like Crocker Amazon, Silver Terrace, Oakland Tracks, Clockwork, Franklin, uh, Walls of Fame in San Jose. However, the most notorious was a place located in SF, at the heart of downtown, Market Street and Van Ness, the mecca for riders from the world over. I mean, the spots that were dope were like, Psycho City, number one. You know, Psycho City was the premier place, you know, for, for bombers, man, to go do pieces. The first time I painted it was uh, July 4th, 1985, um, in broad daylight. There was a bunch of other pieces in there, but it wasn't like a popular spot until Doug got up his, his production there. And I never went there with intention, oh, I'm going to name this place. I think people named it because maybe it was the first, like, larger burner that was there. But, uh, and it picked up, like, the, you know, like, how graffiti spreads, man. You have a throw up right here, a couple tags right here, then you get them a few feet away, and before you know them, you got it across the way, and before the whole area is covered. The Frisco, are you with me? The Frisco, are you with me? Right on Market Street. How can you beat that? I remember going to Psycho City and seeing some crazy colorful pieces, but it bugged me out because it was like a legal spot. You go to do a piece, like the next day, anybody could come go over you, and that kind of like bugged me out. Yeah, it's just really raw pieces would just go over raw pieces, and it was just it seemed more like competitive. It was kind of a spot on the weekends where you go, and for damn sure you were going to run into a bunch of damn riders. Psycho City was a really cool yard. I mean, it was pretty. It was pretty big. It was cool that it was right in downtown. It was good. It had a lot of a lot of people have come do cool pieces. You know, it was constantly changing. It was always a new burner, always a new whole wall. People came from all over. That's how I met fools from Oakland, Berkeley, even uh, Daly City. You know, all the way down to San Jose. Fools came from. I mean, the wall had probably 150 layers of paint on it. Like, come on. Oh, they're gonna bust me for graffiti. Well, what about all this shit? The city is circulating the word that it means to get very tough with graffiti artists. Mayor Feinstein took her paintbrush and rollers to the Mission District, carrying her fight against filth and graffiti to the streets. She was joined by an army of roughly 200 volunteers. Police have joined the fight with an undercover task force, making 200 arrests. Jordan. Remember when Jordan first became the mayor? Okay, what Jordan did was went around to like some of these, you know, the owners of these warehouses where they was giving the kids the permission, like Psycho. That was the end of Psycho right there. He threatened these people there in Franklin Auto that if you let these kids ride on this thing, we will shut you down. I went to jail for that and shit. He, and so the fuck did. They just like, that, that, that was the end of Psycho. That was the end of Franklin. That was the end of Clockwork. They, there's just the cops would come through and just started telling people that it wasn't cool anymore and, and then they fenced it down. It really just kind of got contained in that one area for so long and once they got rid of it, it was kind of a good thing because things started to spread. New spots started to come up. Once they shut down Psycho City in about 92, 93 or so, once they shut that down, illegal graffiti in San Francisco exploded. Yeah. So as much as they were trying to put our culture under arrest, all it did was put some fire under our ass to be like, oh, we gotta go back to the street, we have no choice. And it also did that with style, because now that you're out on the street, you, you know, you gotta get up quick. It made people go back to their straight letter. Yeah. The city was smart at that point, they probably would have left it, because it probably would have, you know, kept the problem to a minimum. But, you know, they, they don't always see these things. <laughs> yeah. This is Psycho City today. There's nothing left. It's a vacant parking lot. You can actually go to the wall and chip away at it. You can reveal the history that lies hidden in there. It's sad in a way. Thousands of layers of stories. Gone. Whitewashed forever. Rest in pieces.
With the closure of Psycho City, San Francisco became a playground for illegal works, what is commonly referred to as bombing. TMF had slowed down at times. TWS, I think, called it quits. Who else is paying? It really got to that point where when Psycho City was closed, it was all about finding the ill spot, you know? It has nothing to do with how fresh you are and how dope your style is or how many styles you have running. It's you make one throw up and you just get it up everywhere in town. Twist throw ups everywhere, J throw ups everywhere. This whole city got pretty crushed during 93 and I think most of 94. They were kind of more into taggers, tagging, you know. Twist was capable, obviously, doing whatever he wanted, really, but that was just what he chose to do. Yeah, they definitely set it off for a lot of kids. I remember one time when I was like 15 or something, I was in an abandoned building downtown. So I ran away from home or whatever, got kicked out of the house. And that night while I was sleeping there, like KR and Twist came and I watched them do the throw ups on the um, fire escape, Six and Howard. KR brought Cream to San, you know, to San Francisco and uh, him and Twist were like the ones just wrecking shit with mob tags, you know. And when we started seeing KR and Shock and then, uh, you know, we knew, we knew Twist uh, the whole time, but he was bombing with them and these guys were going all over the place doing these beautiful throw-ups. It, uh, it really inspired us. I think that, you know, I was just coming from New York. I, I was just, that's like kind of the graffiti that I knew at the time. I mean, throw-ups, car tags, hit spots, and that's how you're supposed to do it. You like graffiti? Ah, uh, so-so. Depends on what it is, right? Yeah, and if it's artwork, it's cool, you know. You know what, I, man, I've seen some real cool ones. There's some guy that does like a horse. Oh, that's a girl. What? Reminisce. Reminisce. That's her name. If I remember I, I'm walking around a corner and just seeing this, like, horse grazing in the middle of some street in a tenderloin, going, what the fuck is this? What's well, like a throw-up. It's like two colors, you got your white, your black, but it's a horse. I was like, yo, this is bugged out because it's like, I like a throw up, but it's not, it's like a character. Back in the day, the big difference was people like Twist and, and Reminisce were really focused on the imagery, you know, of symbols and, and whatnot, the screws and the faces, the horses, and there was other people doing similar stuff um, rather than focusing strictly on letters. There's a lot of people painting kind of like offbeat stuff. I was interested in that kind of stuff. Back in 1989, San Francisco was struck by a major earthquake, an obvious tragedy with the loss of life and the demolition of buildings. But at the same time, it opened up vacant foundations, which would become writers' subterranean art galleries. People just started taking it to all the pits where they were building all these new buildings and uh, the area around what is now Pac Bell Park was being bombed. I mean, it, looked, it was destroyed at the time because they, they knocked down so many buildings you would have thought parts of it looked like the South Bronx, you know. And like the pits were like really like the place you'd go to see like the galleries and like where it's really at. A vacant lot won't sit for more than a week before it's filled in and there's a building there. Whereas it before, the same sort of little pit yards and stuff would run forever. I started doing a bunch of pits around town, like pits where they were about to do construction on and stuff. But those, those things would run, I mean, they would run a long time. So we started doing pits 
just because, you know, I could do a pit basically like an hour or two after it got dark. I could paint and be, be fucking done with the piece by like 11 or 12 at night and go home. The biggest change in Bay Area graffiti is that there's not that many kids from the Bay Area doing it. A lot of people have moved to the Bay Area from various other places and they're kind of, you know, I mean, it's not the hardest place to paint in. Then in my day, when we were coming up, there was a lot more people coming into the city, filtering in, people from out of town trying to represent. Bless came there, Jace, Giant, Some, Cycle, Felon, Soap. San Francisco has had a lot of influence from other people. It's a small city, so people come there, they do shit, everybody sees it, and it kind of like expands that little gene pool. Move to the left if you hate the situation. Taking place, we making space for the good to enter. The bad to surrender them rhymes that remind me of someone who answered. I got facts showing how deep dogs attract the odds in our favor. You can relax while I'm just here explain how you be up and how to stay playing. That time, 93, is what really got me got me to really want to move to San Francisco. San Francisco was really dope then. And then I moved up there in 95 when I was 18. And coming up here when I first got here, I saw a lot of creative people doing things that I had never really seen or I didn't think would really be accepted in graffiti. I was in San Francisco for graduate school, uh, Academy Art College downtown. I came here because of skateboarding at first, because Embarcadero. I wanted to go to, to a big city and fucking really rock shit. It's almost like San Francisco history in general. There's always been so many influences coming here, and once they leave something here, it, it becomes San Francisco. You know, so it's like a microcosm for that. A lot of people want to call this vandalism. Vandalism's throwing a brick through a window. This is a study. It's a craft. It's a science. Every piece has a structure to it. It has a form. It's got movement. It's got colors. It's got a flow. It's got arrows. Bits, little doodads here and there. These are the elements that make up a piece, but to have style is a whole nother ball game. To me, having style means you have your certain aesthetic or your certain type of graffiti that you work on and try to perfect. When people look at your stuff, they can identify it as yours. Even if you write a different name or something else, they'll know you did it because they know your style. To have style means a lot, man. It, it goes a long way in this game. And I'd say our style is based on funk, traditional funk, but everyone's got their own interpretation of it. Chuck Bizarro and Doug, you know, uh, their styles, or twist tags, you know, uh, they just have this style and this flow, and they're beautiful and very precise, but they're still very readable and, and almost simple in a sense. Each person in our crew has their own individual style. The burners developed and developed, and everybody had a burner style. It was a great time. I mean, if you look around, there's letters everywhere. You know, there's letters on anything and everything you can think of. And all you have to do is simply take those letters, make them bigger, add, you know, a 3D to it, and then you got some graffiti. You take those same things and bend them in the right places, and now you got some, like, funk. And then, you know, you add some connections, and you got some wild style. I still think it's the style capital of the U.S. These are your writers writers, behind the scenes type fellas, staples of the bay. That's the, the funk style that I'm down with, is that hard train style that's based on bombing. Get up quick and you can simplify it to a 15 minute piece or you can like multiply it to like a, you know, two hour burner. These two working class crews have continued rocking the Bay Area funk style for years, FSC and HTK. 
Hilltop Kids, Hard Times Known, Hail the Kings, Hard to Kill, Halftime Creation, Hieroglyphic Transcendental Knowledge. Us, we, we progressed together. We all got better together. We all learned how to do every little trick together, every single little thing. We discussed which colors don't work on the wall, which ones do. Yeah, we've developed as a crew. So this was the flavor of SF Graph, funk, up until some visitors arrived from Los Angeles, bringing with them their own version of style. Their style was pointy, it was jagged, it was kind of out of place in the Bay. Because San Francisco and the Bay Area didn't have that particular style until they started coming up here and they started bombing a lot. You know, them kids from LA, they come and they climb up into these like weird little spots and paint shit that I never even would have thought of painting. Less. Uh, provoke Saber. I gotta give those guys a pat on the back, you know? They were, you know, they did a lot of work. MSK did a lot of dope work. I mean, MSK and AWR, like, Lee, like, it was really obvious when they came to town. San Francisco is just, has this, like, entirely different vibe than LA. You know, I love LA. I'm like all about LA, but it was just a nice break going to San Francisco because you could just like run around, like hop in the bus, go here and here. It's like everything is so like so close, you know, and there's just so much shit going on and like this is great, man. It was just like this like like graffiti vacation, you know? And I didn't want it to end. <laughs> we come from the Los Angeles School of Painting and that's that's like basically at that point in time they spent so much time buffing and you didn't want to be caught on the ground, so basically you climb, you climb to remain a part of the, the environment. You, you climbed higher and, and further, so that would be harder for them to buff. And that's, that's at the point in time period, the progression where we were at in LA. So we moved up here and just brought a piece of that with us. Instead of painting like a spot on the street or an alley, they're above a billboard on a steel girder on the side of a bridge. There was, there was a lot of tension going on, I think, between um, between some guys coming up from LA and, and guys from Frisco. And they really butted heads. See, sometimes somebody comes in, they paint a few good spots, and they're out. You know, it's kind of like a cycle of people coming and going, but. There's still a lot of local cats around, you know? I felt angry, I felt mad. I felt fucking like, fuck, I gotta come back and do something about this shit, because if I don't, then we're gonna go out like the city that just fucking anybody could come here to take over the shit, and we ain't having that shit here. But at the same time, I think it pushed a lot of people to the next level. They realized that they couldn't just sit on their ass all the time. They had to be put in work. Folks, dope, but he's not from here. You just have to go with the flow and just realize that, you know, this is your city. If you're gonna be here, you're gonna remain here and you're gonna run shit. And if people wanna come through and leave, they can do that, but I'll be here forever. If somebody comes with a little more heart than you and, and is, down to, is down to fucking, you know, put their ass in the line and, and put in work and, and make it happen, I mean, more props to them, you know, no matter where they're from. I think there was a time when, when you know, it was only locals. It was only San Franciscans here, kind of in the 80s bombing, and in the 90s there was a little resentment when other people would come up. But eventually, you know, in true San Francisco fashion, we all learned to live together, and um, we were all better off because of it. Lord Radio and 
hell bop on the Bay Bridge Faded, trying to find Smiley's house Thank God we made it Yo, blunts, bras, and beats Keep it low through the streets And niggas give them his pounds Cause of these dope ass sounds We run around like ships Over these beats I flips The bass is hitting so hard That you'll see these skits Well check it out Make sure it doesn't happen again I got my grip on it So turn it up to volume 10 Volume 10? What? Like that brother from LA Lord Radio and Hellbot Me streaking through the bay We all city like the mayor You see my name on more fresh shit than Creed Taylor The Jeep for international lady Like a sailor Like a sailor I get drunk and bust flows to the beat Like my man Jay I feel the what? agony of defeat Cause sucker chumps wanna test huh. step Like we don't know We doing, we doing shows in San Francisco That's right young rider Got a hit for all you riders It's time to bless another track We getting rid of the whack right. We put them in the back right. With the right. other tap and Z shit what? Beats hit hard Make the trolley mm. too hot yeah. Old folks grab the collies And vacate the bank See a name in Northern Life There's love in double K We getting wild for the night We getting wild Wow. For the night, Boy, and it all night, went yo. down. On what? On what? Your rocket shows for you and your crew. We rolling blunts and doing the do. Yeah. We doing shows with a mic check of what? One, two. On the on a bad foot, Yo. coming through. We was drinking, smoking, more smoking, more drinking. Drinkin'. Didn't think about the morning hangover, just didn't want to be sober. Yo, ready, go. Tell me, how did you feel? Like I'll never catch a DUI. Hit gas, yeah. kill, make a left, I'm market. Yo, Mr. Double K. Hey, hey, what's up? Roll up the windows and spark your deal. Yo, you didn't have to ask twice. Just nope. park on the top of the hill so we can peep the city like I'm on a war to a keep it unlocked like Alcatraz. Alcatraz. Doing Alcatraz. a San Francisco show like Hubert Live. CTI 7071, go buy it. Bring the drums like Harvey May Sun. Don't, Don't try it. Better luck next time. Trying to step to the peak. You in the bay, punk. I guess you ain't heard about LA. Yo, Double K, tell them that the piece you need with the beat. Yeah. The UTS shows a San Francisco treat. A San Francisco treat. Just like some right so rony Put it in your mouth Let it run down the middle Just like Moni Phony homie oh, You never rock a party The no. whack ass crew gets called out See I played a Rod Roddy Come on now I took the Southland punks From the concrete Have you asked me questions From your head to your feet You don't want none of this shit That I'm offering Saying that P can't rock your city Ooh, for a Very often we win Yo very seldom we lose Fights rocking them motherfucking whole city On Yo Rolling blunts and doing the do. do, do. Chilling with your girl and her crew. Her crew, her crew. Scaring old people, still doing the do. We're doing the do, brother. Yeah. Making collect calls into another area, area code. code. We mode, yeah. We be the B1. Oh. We be the man that's next. Oh. And I be the double K. And we clowning, downing, pouring it. Ounces, vodka, whatever, juice, loose, San Francisco, here we come, we coming back, we gon' have a gun, much love to the Bay Area. constitute defacing of public property in a rather uh, ridiculous and then again obscene form. We do want color, we do want light, we do want artistic freedom, but not at the cost of damaging other people's property. I don't really get out of hand, you know, like sometimes like uh, kids write on the windows with the etching fluid on like restaurants and businesses, I don't like that. It's the, the etchings and the window scratching that really screws us up. Okay. Those glass 
windows are really expensive to replace, about 1500 bucks, and for a small independent business like mine, that's, that's a large chunk of our change. It doesn't bother me personally because graffiti is an art, and it's an art that is rarely respected, you know. It depends on where it's at, you know, if it's not defacing like property like this or if it's out, you know, just on, on a blank wall or something like that, hey, that's fine, you know, but when you're defacing property like a booth or a train or something like that, so that's, you know, that's our money going back to clean that up. We, we get a lot of edge glass, especially on the cars that don't have camera systems. And that's, and that's the most costly type of graffiti to bar. That's their way of expressing themselves. They maybe they have anger, maybe they have issues. I don't like it on the bus. You know, uh, I think there's a culture behind it. Well, let's put it this way. The way I look at it is simply this: it's simply a form of uh, unbridled vandalism. For the most part, teenagers, even some adults, will exercise this unbridled vandalism for whatever it's worth because it's part of the name of the game in this permissive society as it were. Back in the day the city had higher priorities to focus on rather than graffiti. Graffiti writing was not the issue it is today. If you got caught you were maybe hassled by the cops released, and at most a misdemeanor ticket was issued. Some examples of misdemeanors are petty theft, fraud, drug use, vandalism, punishments include community service, small fines, and in some circumstances, a little bit of jail time. This is in stark contrast to the felonious crimes such as grand theft, kidnapping, rape, murder, and now graffiti vandalism thanks to Proposition 21. Proposition 21 was passed in the year 2000. This new law allowed any vandalism over $400 in damage to be prosecuted as a felony. And it also labels groups of kids of three or more to be classified as a street gang. The youth targeted proposition is also being used against adults. Felony punishments are way more severe than misdemeanors and include loss of civil rights such as voting, serious imprisonment, and in some cases, execution. And so, another job for the police and the court. Johnny Marvin is now in the hands of the law. This is the first time he's been caught, but his delinquent tendencies began long before in the conflicts of an unhappy home and in the hangout of the gang which was his refuge. Now, what will become of this boy? Johnny and 200,000 other youngsters who are arrested each year are America's number one crime problem. Can't something be done to help these twisted young lives and set them straight? If you think that graffiti is little more than fun and games for rebellious teenagers, San Francisco authorities beg to differ. They have brought serious charges against eight adults who police say are members of a graffiti gang that has spent years defacing the city. The group, they say, calls itself KUK, which stands for Kill Until Killed. The maximum penalty is a $20,000 fine and up to seven years behind bars. And police say since the indictments, they've noticed a lot less new graffiti. They come to your house, take all your shit, go to jail, bail out. Then they might throw more charges on you, you know, because they got other charges stacked. And these people are just against you being on the street. They want you to be, they want you to be locked up. You get indicted, you know, and then, you know, sit back in jail for a while get bail money up, bail out again, 
then they can throw more shit like another county like Oakland or Berkeley or somebody else to press charges on you go back in bail out again all you have like in the back of your head is that in a couple months you know I'm going to prison Proposition 21 is some ill shit because when you get charged with it, it's okay, so it's a gang charge. And all of a sudden, you're a, you're a gang member and that could add a year to your sentence automatically. And anything over a year, you're going to prison. In SF right now, it just like a judge threw it out. You know, she said that uh, that they weren't gang members, you know, and so she, she threw it out. You know, it just lost in the court of appeals. The DA appealed it. So now that charge is back on and it's just like that enhances every other charge you have like every felony count of graffiti or whatever that enhances it so much proposition 21 is like pretty much like a prison dispatch charge you know it's like as soon as you have that you're going to prison does it make me not want to do it yeah i guess so if i thought about it i just don't uh, think about that oh i don't i don't think it's a just penalty at all because you know, at the same time that I see that, I see on the same wall a wheat paste for the Lion King from Disney Productions, and I see a million other wheat paste, and those people don't go to jail. Well, it, it comes down to, you know, it is malicious mischief. Um, the idea of, of destroying other people's property and the idea of, you know, defacing places in the city, I mean, it, it, it's, it's first off, it's personal property most of the time that's being affected. But second of all, you have a situation where it looks bad. You know, it looks like, you know, people don't care about their property. And, and you know, so it is a problem and it is something that we are addressing. Well, we have a uh, graffiti unit and there were officers assigned to that unit to um, go after people that are doing the tagging or the graffiti in the city. Especially like in, in the Bay, like this year, it's like Oakland's exceeding its fucking motor rates. It seems like every other week in Fillmore, like someone's getting shot. They're still wasting mad money on a, on a, on a graffiti case. Because there's always somebody new that's coming along saying, let's get rid of graffiti. This is how we're going to do it. And then they try their little way to do it, and it doesn't work. And then they fail. And then the next person comes, and they fail, and they fail, and they fail. Because like graffiti is just a war. Along with battling the law, Writers faced the chaos of the urban landscape. In the late 90s, one writer seemed to take more risk than anyone, the all-city king, known as Ty. Ty was Jonathan Lim, and he was 18 years old when I met him. He would go bomb by himself in the fucking rain, in the cold, he would not eat. He wouldn't fucking give a shit about going out with girls, or kicking it, or clothes, or nothing. All he cared about was racking his paint, racking his supplies, and getting up. I think at one point in San Francisco, you couldn't go on any block of the entire city without seeing at least a couple marker tags, some spray paint tags, and at least a hollow throw up. Sometimes a hollow throw up and a filled in throw up. Unlike every block of the city, like that's really not even an exaggeration. I never seen anybody up as much as him, uh, one person. I mean, he was up like, it would take 10 riders to be up as much as he was. He knew like all riders and all different crews and like everybody loved him because he was like really generous and like he'd give you paint and like give you markers and like he stole so much stuff like crazy. I'm standing in the uh, paint section picking my colors and all of a sudden I hear, what's up cycle? And I turn and look and there's Ty with a big duffel bag and like I'm loading paint into, into this shopping cart. And he's like, what's going on, dude? I'm like, nothing, just picking some colors. He's like, yo, is it all clear? I'm like, I guess so, dude. And he like looks up this way and he looks that way and the aisle's clear. And he just opens this big duffel bag, big green duffel bag. <laughs> just like shoves all this paint in the duffel bag, zips it, and just like, and like runs out, you know, runs out of the, the paint aisle. It was on uh, St. Patrick's Day night, and I remember Saber was gone, he was doing something. I was at the house, and MQ came over, and, and Ty came over, they both came over together. And he was like, oh, let's go bomb, let's go bomb, let's go, let's go do that spot tonight. Like, man, you know, we've been, we've been painting all week, you know, just chill, let's party one night, St. Patrick's Day night, you know, let's just party one night, go get drunk, hang out, just relax, have a good time. He's like, no, no, I gotta bomb. I'm like, all right, man, just whatever, do your thing, be careful. 
was by himself in the tenderloin. He was plotting on this one rooftop. He was just gonna go do a filling or something probably on it. There was like a little drain pipe that she had to shimmy up to go to the roof. I guess he was going up the pipe, whatever. It made a little bit of noise. I don't know, who knows, but there ended up being a guy that lived inside this building. The guy came out, you know, said, what the fuck are you doing? And you know, Ty steps back, hey, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to break in. I was just doing graffiti and he like showed him the pain in his back. And the guy pulled out a gun, pointed a gun at him. And the little kid put up his hands and said, no, wait, stop, don't shoot. And Ty obviously scared as fuck. This big fucking grown man's pointing a big ass gun at his head. He turned, ran down the steps. You know, as, as he was running down the stairs away from this guy, this motherfucker blasted him in the back of the head. <laughs> Because of the fact that his parents were immigrants, he was a minority, and the fact that uh, he was doing graffiti in the middle of an illegal activity, that case didn't get followed up or paid attention to the way it should have been. He was praised in the newspaper as being as killing a robber, you know? They just covered it up, and, and they, didn't, they didn't really mind that an 18-year-old young boy was murdered in the Tenderloin by, by a, a, a person, you know, who owned property. They, they didn't care about that. I was really hurt, um, and when this guy got off, like it, that was, you know, it's, it's fucked up. Like it's, you know, where's the justice in that? I mean, the kid was just hanging out and maybe climbing on the roof with some girl to drink a beer and like fool around with some girl. It might have been a different story. It might have been like, you know, but oh shit, the kid's a menace to society and his parents don't even speak English. Oh my God, you know, you know. Whatever, just sweep it under the rug, it's a tragedy, oh well. His blood was there like for a week afterwards. His blood was still there, a big puddle of blood. You know what I'm saying? The little fucking, little kid, you know, just turned 18. Unfortunately, you know, the way it worked out, it, his piece of history it, is a tragic one, but at the same time, he influenced all of us and he brought a lot of people together. And he is now definitely a martyr for graffiti, you know? That's Ty. I mean, Ty, Ty is a legend now. That kid could have could have been like King, and you know, he did King SF, but you know, he could have just really. I would have liked to seen given the proper time and uh, influence and encouragement. I would have liked to seen what that kid had to offer. You know. Every day was dedicated to graph, and like honestly, I've never met anyone in any kind of medium or any kind of lifestyle has dedicated so much of their life to one thing. You know, he was fully full of graffiti. I've been asked a million times, why do I write? Certain things you just can't explain. But I do it for the love, the love of writing. Because I love painting, just simply for that. In fact, once they're done, they're done. They're only as good as the next one. I just, you know, once it's finished, it's like, what next? I just have to be in the act of pressing this cat. <laughs> it gave me character. It gave me a sense of purpose, it gave me a community, and it was all underground. It was all out of hidden out of the way. So it was really cool because it was rebellious. You know, everybody has levels of, of respect. What do they respect? What are they not going to write on? I mean, for me, I have a certain amount of respect, but if I do choose to put my art somewhere, it's 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 really kind of like, yeah, I know the consequence, and so what? You know, it's really because just don't care. Why do I do it? <laughs> what do you get out of oh, it? Oh man, what do I get out of it? Headaches. I mean, the reason why I continue to do grab, man, is just because I have this love affair with letters. I mean, I love letters, man. I mean, that's what keeps me in it. Why do I do it? I do it for myself. And I do it, I do it because I can. And I do it because I run this shit. This is my city, this is where I'm from, this is where I was born and raised. And it's kind of like my mark. This is where I, this is where I crush. It probably, in, in a lot of ways, it probably saved my life. You know, who knows what I would be doing if it weren't for graffiti. You don't really choose the arts. The arts choose you. 
You know, you don't pick to choose the clarinet. You, the clarinet picks you. You don't choose to paint watercolors or oil. Or, your medium picks you. I don't know, man. I, I dig paint. I dig spray paint. So it picked me. I could be doing still lifes. I could be doing realist painting. I could, uh, I could just be doing graphic design behind a computer. But the artwork I do speaks to, like, probably tens and thousands of uh, other kids across both the United States, probably Europe. It's just like on the way to work, I want to see a tag, you know, it makes me, like me looking at me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm alive, I'm here, you know, I f I'm fucking something and I, and I will be something. Why? Because I make myself something. They're not, they're not getting paid for it, you know, they're not getting any kind of like congratulations for it. They're just, they're just out there risking their life to paint something that like hopefully a few people might be able to appreciate and that's it. And I think there's something to be said for that, you know. I think that's definitely something that's worth like taking note of. Yo, like there's graffiti here, it's gotta be here for a reason. Instead of saying like, they must have, you know, problems and they must be a malicious person, they, they might actually look at the society and be like, you know, the, the way government and society is being controlled by, you know, capitalist big business is messed up and we should do something about it or whatever. Instead of like looking at the person doing graffiti, maybe they should look at the cause of why that person started, you know? I mean, I no doubt still be doing art if I was wasn't in graffiti, but graffiti gave me gave me a voice, you know? Really, really gave me a voice. You know, I didn't realize this for a long time, but as after I got older, it dawned on me that, you know, I can walk up and write my message. I mean, all the other messages that we get are controlled by newspapers and radio and television and billboards and print ads and magazines and all these things, and they're all paid for. I could walk up for free and put my message out there, and as long as you're willing to get arrested for it and you have that mentality, you can write whatever you want and put any message you want. You know, graffiti is really the last true free speech. Consider this. 98% of the works you have seen in this video are gone. Forever. They no longer exist. It's extremely temporal, just like life. The tag is the essential part of writing. It's the most fun. The most offensive and to some the most visually unappealing part of our culture. But it's the essence. Being out late at night, walking around, you experience a completely different world. Writing is a culture of experience, and it's a craft that will never vanish. It's the independent lieutenant in it To win the pennant on my sleeve I wear a pendant shaped like a heart of gold The pace is harsh as my hand marks the scroll But delicate like life in her rings and charcoal See etchings are engraved as blessings are saved For those who question the way they're expected to behave It's so hard to face a day when it won't look you in the eye Maybe you're just afraid to live if you ain't afraid to die But what the fuck do I know? I'm just living life's lessons Why y'all claim to know the answers? We don't understand the questions I step into the session like the changing of the seasons Cause for me rhyming come naturally it's as easy as breathing Words hang in the evening like clouds of dank smoke Type of guy who laugh all the way to the bank broke And still, I can't cope without it for you to kill I perform for the thrills, my brain's a orgy of skill Can't afford my next meal, but if I buy a box cutter I can dish out a buck fifty for this cup of coffee, brother While the industry copies each other, life gets more monotonous The world's turning slower when it stops, maybe they'll copy us I feel like a teardrop on the bloody face of God I hope this guy knows I was put on earth to catch her when she falls I'll hold her like my best friend dying in my arms Just like your mom will take the song And embrace it when I'm gone I'm determined, willing, able Capable of making a living Maintaining a stable position By learning, building, creating a vision In the face of adversity I make decisions with certainty I'm determined So this is our writing history And it will carry on for years and years Peace In the face of adversity I make decisions with certainty If a tree fell in the woods And no one was there to hear it Would it make the same sound? And now we're going to Paris. Yeah, now we're going to Paris to do canvases, bro. We made it. <laughs> is, it, is this on? A twist. I want my black book back. I've had it for two years now. I want my I want my black book back, Barry. Barry, where's my black book? Better have like 30 pages done in that shit. I wish there was some sort of rule where if the cop was going to give you a ticket, if you guys could have a fist fight, and if I could beat a cop's ass, then he'd have to be like, word, peace out, dude, you beat my ass. That would be so fresh, it would be a totally different world.
it's a Toronto. You know, he and Matt Cool would be ruling San Francisco right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 I totally lost my train of thought. In my opinion, I do not like most graffiti writers, and I don't have in anything in common with most graffiti writers besides graffiti. Like, down with the funk, not a new wave punk. We make you suckers cry when we say that shit's junk. TFS with a capital T, been down for years as you can see. Back in style, quick as a flash, burning your toys like a bowl of hash. I'm saying that was the anthem, the TFS anthem. You know, it's a hard game, and we're we're the, we're the modern forefront. We are art. We are it. Our art was created. You know. Um, <clears throat> third wave of riders. I, I don't. I didn't know the was broken down in the waves, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, I understand that. I'll tell you one time, I got busted on uh, Broadway doing a UB40 uh, throw up on a window, and the cop said, freeze! Book, book down, got caught. <laughs> and the guy said, you know what, you're that UB40, huh? I said, no, nah, no, I, exactly, uh, I was uh, throwing up a oob as a new rap group. They don't give me that bullshit. <laughs> Thank you.